Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel, where we're gonna take it easy for a bit. No more shouting about being legends and taking the piss. The temptation to play it straight for the whole Project Cars 3 review was just too strong and I, I couldn't pass it up. That said, there are a few important things I wanted to share with you guys in all seriousness which I didn't get to tack on to the end of that video, especially for those of you on the fence about whether or not you want to pick the game up. For those who aren't familiar with the video I'm referring to, I'll link it up above for you now. This time, we're going to relax with a bit more of a conversational tone. Getting the Project Cars 3 review out on time was a bit of an epic feat on my end, requiring about 30 hours of work across two days to both capture the footage, script, commentate, and edit it all together. Because SMS, quite understandably, didn't supply me with a review copy ahead of time, I really had to scramble to make sure I got the video out before you guys pulled the trigger on buying the game. This time around, I'm going to just share my earnest thoughts with you over some of the footage captured during that process. Jokes and awful, confused marketing aside, it's quite clear by this point that Project Cars 3 is an arcade game. It just is. Now, if we set aside SMS's promises over the years and their marketing leading up to the game and simply take it at face value, we're left with the main question of, is it a good arcade game? Well, like most things, in some ways yes, and in many other ways, no. Allow me to explain. I spent quite a few hours wrangling Project Cars 3 with a high-end direct drive sim rig, and it just didn't work. With assists off, the cars just felt like they had virtually no traction, the slip felt super canned and easy to correct for, and in just about every way the handling felt like a regression to the prequel Project Cars 2. After getting the video online, I subsequently spent an evening getting drunk with my housemate and playing it on a controller. This experience, ironically, was far more enjoyable. Understandably, there have been quite a few concessions made to the handling model in order to make the game gel with gamepads. On a gamepad, Project Cars 3 feels kind of surreal. On one hand, it has those assisted arcade sensibilities to it, even with all assists technically set to off in the game. But on the other hand, you can still feel an immensely capable and nuanced simulation engine beneath it all. It may be restrained to fit within the constraints of the arcade framework SMS are trying to satisfy, but it's there all the same. The tire flex, the suspension geometry and chassis flex, all the good stuff, you can somehow feel it even on a controller. In that sense, it's actually superior to most regular arcade racing games. Fantastic, right? SMS have just switched markets and made a killer arcade racing game. Well, not really. See, the kinks start to show very shortly after the novelty of the controller handling wears off. It's hard to know where to start because there's so much wrong with Project Cars 3 as a game, not just a sim, that it's hard to recommend to not just sim racers, but anybody. One of the pervading problems with Project Cars 3 is inconsistency. It's very clear that what's been released hasn't been playtested enough. On your initial tutorial race in the C8R, one of the first problems you'll be greeted with is the highly erratic AI. Given the constraints of how the game is set up, these guys are just about impossible to race cleanly. You'll be trading paints and pushing them around like a round of bumper cars before long. Because you can't qualify for your starting position and most races are confined to just two or three laps, you have to make up a lot of ground very fast, and there's only one way to do that. To those of you who aren't super serious about your racing games, that may be totally fine, but to those of us who follow racing as a pursuit, it definitely is. See, the problem is that the AI are highly inconsistent. I've had them blitz past me on straights as if they're fielding 200 more horses under the hood, only to eventually catch up with them as they struggle to negotiate a set of turns or arbitrarily slow down on the final straight, seemingly allowing me to win. See, the problem with having AI that's just not dialed in is that it feels very unsatisfying to race. There's no sense of achievement, no matter who you are. In fact, it reminds me of the early teething issues that Automobilista 2 experienced, which goes to figure given that both games are sharing the same engine, and after playing both, very likely started out using the same AI framework. One of the things which is really bothersome is the inconsistent sense of difficulty throughout the main campaign. Sometimes trials are extremely easy, whereas others almost expect you to be fielding a different class of car than what the game will allow for. 
Some of the tracks, especially if you're, let's say, a veteran sim racer and you know them in and out, you can really just crush through, whereas others you can just grind away for hours and hours without making a dent in what they feel is going to be of gold class time, then subsequently move on to the next tier or a higher order of racing where the time trials miraculously become super easy again. An extremely inconsistent spread of difficulty. The other big one is bugs. The game quite simply just wasn't QC'd enough before release. You get all manner of bugs, from custom car tunes not wanting to accept because the button gets locked out, to your upgrades and car customizations not counting for a few races, to damage carrying over even if you restart a race. Here's one that you guys will really like. There's this bizarre issue with replays, where your car comes across as some ghostly spectre, and the moment you leave the replay to go back into the game and restart a race, suddenly most of the other cars on the field are semi-transparent. In other races, the track limits get cancelled so that you can quite literally just go straight over corners without consequence. The list is never ending. One of the big ones that people continue to mention is the graphics. The game looks notably worse than Project Cars 2. This is hard to deny. What's also very strange is that the game runs worse. It runs worse than even ACC, one of the most demanding sim racing titles in existence, running on Unreal Engine 4. It's hard to account for this other than sloppy programming. What also lends credence to the idea is that the vast majority of content for the game was straight ported in from Project Cars 2, with not much alteration whatsoever. In fact, some tracks have actually gone missing, such as Spa Francochamp and Le Mans. Furthermore, the single player campaign comes across as somewhat monotonous and unsatisfying to race through. Ultimately, it all comes down to simply racing to satisfy a set of criteria, unlocking a given amount of points, getting into a new league, and rinse repeating the process incrementally as you unlock increasingly prestige cars. Again, the issue is that the progression mechanic feels very arbitrary. Some of the race requirements involve things such as needing to do eight quote-unquote clean overtakes, which in many cases resulted in me overtaking the entire field, finding myself in pole, then having to drop back and let them pass simply to overtake them all over again to satisfy this criteria to unlock the next tier of progression. It's just awkward and unsatisfying. See, the real tragedy of Project Cars 3 isn't that the developer turned its back on the sim racing community which funded the series into existence and tried to appeal to a lesser demanding casual market. The tragedy of Project Cars 3 is that it's a poorly realized game which ultimately doesn't appeal to anyone. If you want a hardcore single player simulator, you can get R Factor 2 and get way more engagement than this game could ever provide or you could get iRacing for constant online action. Conversely, if you're more into casual races, you've got the Forza and Gran Turismo series, both of which are vastly better at handling that side of the spectrum. To further add to this conundrum, if you saw a glimmer of hope in what SMS were doing with the early Project Cars games, now you have Automobilista 2, a true simulator using the madness engine to its utmost potential. In fact, it's more of a sequel to the Project Cars games than Project Cars 3 is. Not only does AMS2 look and run better than Project Cars 3 on the same engine, but it's plainly just far better to drive in, and before long, we'll include a similar roster of content. Ultimately, leading up to release, if you looked at the patterns, you could see this coming. Slightly Mad Studios went on a slight hiatus after they finished churning out DLC for Project Cars 2, and planned a number of seemingly failed initiatives which included creating a mobile version of Project Cars, as well as a gaming console to compete with Microsoft and Sony, and the unholy trinity was completed when the company was finally sold to Codemasters earlier this year. Most of us know that the mobile gaming market dwarfs the mainstream gaming industry in sheer revenue and profitability versus investment. The moment a company decides to dip their feet into this arena, whether it be Blizzard or Slightly Mad Studios, you know where their priorities lie. All of these signs speak of a company looking to maximize its bottom line. While that's understandable, since profit is largely the reason most companies exist, it's pretty obvious that Slightly Mad Studios management is disproportionately focused around it, to the exclusion of all else. What Project Cars 3 plays like is Slightly Mad's failed attempt at cracking the mobile market. It's somehow not only a lesser game than its two prequels, but also manages to undershoot for the casual market it's aiming for. If the developer had a strong, unified vision on what they wanted to create, fueled by true passion, they could have done a remarkable job. 
I've always maintained that the Madness engine contains a tremendous amount of unrealized potential. When I first drove in Project Cars 2, it was the very first time I got the sensation of driving on actual rubber. Hell, it's a sensation I still get on a gamepad playing this faded spectre of what this series once was. The tragedy of Project Cars 3 is not that the developer Borderline defrauded the audience which funded their series and covertly turned their back on them while still claiming there was a place for them at the table. The tragedy of Project Cars 3 is that it never knew what it wanted to be, and as a result, it ended up being nothing for nobody. Even still, I maintain that the Madness engine contains tremendous potential, and had SMS decided whether they were going to faithfully serve either sim racers or casuals, they could have made a great game. But they didn't. So don't waste your money. Make sure to hit that sub and ring the bell to stay up to date with future sim racing news and reviews, and until next time, we'll see you guys later.